Hidden Garden is a production of the University of Minnesota Morris in cooperation with Pioneer Public Television. Additional support provided by Mark and Margaret Yako Julien in honor of Shalom Hill Farm, a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham in southwestern Minnesota. ShalomHillFarm.org. I just love to get flowers and especially roses for special occasions like Mother's Day, our wedding anniversary, Valentine's Day, or really any time. Most of the time we assume all of those flowers have been grown in California or South America. But today we are going to tour a greenhouse right here in Minnesota that produces beautiful roses and flowers that just might end up in our special bouquets. Let's go tour Len Bush Roses. Welcome to Prairie Yard and Garden. I'm host Mary Holm and this week we are in for a beautiful treat. We are going on a tour of Lenbush Roses located in Plymouth, Minnesota. Our tour guide is Jason Lenz, Director of Business Development here at Lenbush. Thanks so much Jason for taking the time to be our tour guide today here at Lenbush. Thank you Mary, we're very happy to have you here. Tell us a little bit about Len Bush Roses. Well, we are a family-owned company. We've been in business for almost 50 years. Next year is our 50th anniversary. Um, the Bush family has been growing flowers and vegetables for well over 100 years in Minnesota. Um, Len Bush is the founder of this company, and it is currently owned by his son, Patrick. Um, that transfer took place about 15 years ago. Okay, about how many roses do you grow here at this facility? We grow just over a million roses a year. Obviously, looking around at all the beautiful flowers, you grow a whole lot more than roses. <laughs> Can you tell us what other we crops do. you grow? We do. We grow Alstroemeria. We grow lilies, both Oriental and LA varieties. Uh, we grow snapdragons, Gerbera daisies, um, freesia, parts of the year and a lot of blooming plants as you can see around us. Yes, I, I've been seeing cyclamen <laughs> and mums and so there's just a beautiful selection that you grow. Yeah. About how many people work here at Len Bush Roses? We have about 170 full-time employees. Um, seasonally through the summer when we're trying to get caught up on all those extra projects, we have a few additional, but uh, for the most part it's about 170 full-time. Uh, about how many varieties of roses do you grow? I think it's about 25 varieties now. Um, it's a reduce from, I think, 34 a few years back, um, but still a good 25 in production, and we also bring in additional varieties to service our client. So what are the most popular varieties that you grow? Um, Penny Lane is a yellow, which is a very, very top favorite of our customers, and uh, Probably Milva. It's a it's a two tone orange rose that is a is a hot one as well. Now that surprises me. I would have thought that red would be your top seller. Red traditionally is a top selling rose. Um, it serves a purpose. It's <laughs> typically for those love encounters or or such things. Um, Valentine's Day red is still the predominant rose. Yeah. Um, although new colors are kind of working their way in, but it's still heavily red rose oriented. Um, Mother's Day and Easter and those other holidays, it's pretty much across the board. Red is not overstanding the other colors at that okay. point. Okay, I was just going to ask that if your numbers and variety selections fluctuate with the different holidays. They do. Um, Valentine's Day and Mother's Day are our two biggest by far holidays of the year. Um, we do over 10% of our business during those two-week portions. Now, how do you actually grow your roses? Do you 
uh, start your own roses or do you get in cuttings or how do you do that? We bring in cuttings, um, although we are just now starting to play with creating our own cuttings. Um, but for the most part, we bring in cuttings and we plant them here, either in uh, sand or cocoa fiber. Those are the two main uh, things that we're planting in currently. Um, mostly in a bucket, a round bucket, and they get drip tubes that go into them and they release from the bottom so that the, the plant doesn't get root rot or it doesn't sit in water. So each rose actually gets its own little feeding tube then? Correct. Oh. Each plant has a couple, couple feeding tubes. Um, the fertilizers injected along with the water into those into those plants. When you were saying that you plant your roses, you said you put them into sand. Do you use potting soil at all? We do not use potting soil in most of the plants that we grow here or the, the crops that we grow here. Usually it's a it's sort of a, a mixture. Um, it could be a soil with a cocoa fiber mix um, that we plant our lilies and oriana lilies in. Um, our gerbs are planted in all sand, and gerbs is very prone. Gerbs are very prone to root rot, so it needs a full drain, and sand doesn't hold the moisture that a soil would. Roses are similar, um, and that's why we we tend to use sand in those crops, so they they do fully drain and don't create a problem when the root, within the root si system. As we were walking through, I noticed that you have cyclamen <laughs> growing here, and um, tell me about that. We do have cyclamen. We grow cyclamen year-round. It's one of our main crops here, and we do, a, we do an awesome job with them. Um, we also grow begonias year-round, calanchos, calendivas, um, and then we have some multiple seasonal crops that we, that we put in along with those crops. And it surprised me so much when I saw the cyclamen because it is such a cool season crop. So how do you... Um, keep the greenhouses cool enough to be able to grow those or are these varieties that have been developed to grow when it's warmer? Most crops don't like it when it's really warm. Right. You can hear the fans going on around us. That is one way we try to keep the temperatures down but it, it really doesn't do a whole lot. It just keeps the air moving and it, and it circles the the outside air temperature back in here. When, when you're under glass, it gets hotter than it is outside typically. And that's all these fans are doing is really making it out, outside temperature. Um, we do have cooling pads that we run um, along the back wall. And the, these fans actually pull that cold air across, but it probably only gains us a degree or two. And I noticed that you have shade cloths on the top of the houses too. That must that help a lot. That helps a little bit as well. Um, yes. But you do have to keep these other things running in order for that to, to, to work. Now, how do you harvest the flowers? One at a time, if you can believe it. <laughs> um, roses, we actually harvest in the bed. Um, people walk down the bed. They circle the bed twice a day once in the morning and once in the afternoon to try and pull the, pull the rose at the preferred um, stage. Then how do you cool and preserve the flowers after they've been cut? Once they're cut, um, we process them, we put them in water that already has a preservative added to it, okay. and then we put them into the cooler, um, roughly 34 degrees is where we hold them at. Um, they last longest and they Basically, it just kind of slows their growth process down by keeping them in that cold of a temperature. What do you figure is the usual life expectancy of the flowers from the time that you harvest um, until the florist needs to use them in a bouquet? That is a trick question. <laughs> Each type of flower has a different vase life, typically. Um, we have some roses, some varieties that we can get up to 16 days in a vase. Um, Gerbras, for example, don't quite have as long of a shelf life. We can get 10 to 12 days out of a, of, out of a Gerbra. Ulstromeria can exceed 16 days. It can, I've, I've seen Ulstromeria three weeks old and still flowering. You had mentioned um, that you ship your flowers. Where all do you ship your flowers and how do you ship them? We ship them in the five state area, the five states being Minnesota, Maine, uh, North Dakota, South Dakota, Iowa, and Wisconsin. Um, we have a few outlying customers outside of that, but for the most part, it's the five-state area. Um, we ship them on our own refrigerated trucks. Um, everything on our delivery trucks that we 
that we deliver to customers is in water. So if you're buying a cut flower from us, we're actually delivering it in water. We did that to reduce the amount of boxes and cardboard that we waste in, in the process here. I assume you ship to flower shops throughout the five state area. Yep. So when the truck unloads, do they carry in the containers and then get the ones that have been emptied and just replace them? Correct. Everything is recycled. It's all a recyclable program. The coolest thing is, is we sell all day. We pack and process all the flowers all night and we deliver overnight. So when the florist gets to their shop in the morning, the flowers are already there. The drivers brought them in, put them in their preferred location in their store, whether it's a cooler, if it's a blooming plant, it's on the counter where they've asked us to put them. So they're ready to go first thing when they get in in the morning. How do the flower shops place an order? Or how do you know what to drop off at which place? They actually call us or we call them. Um, we have a staff of 14 salespeople that covers this area and they all have their own independent customer list. And they, they make calls to them to make sure that you know their needs are covered for this week or what they may have needs for for next week and we put that into the system and if we don't have it in our own production, we'll, we'll bring it in from wherever it is being grown at that time. Is the same delivery driver the person that's going to deliver to them each time? Typically it is, not always, and some of our drivers even get vacation. So okay. <laughs> once in a while, there'll be another driver that'll come in. And because of the territory we cover, we have to change our routes up sometimes so that that driver may not be the same tomorrow, but it'll probably be the next day. It, so it's just a matter of which stops we have to make that particular night. So it kind of varies for how long your drivers will be out on the road too, but depending on how many stops they have. Yep, yep. And we deliver north one night and south the next. So all of our fleet goes north on one night. And so when I mean they have a different route, it just depends on where north those stops are and that just kind of paints a picture of what path each of the drivers has to take to get everybody covered. And uh, then there's special situations like funerals that maybe a flower shop can't plan for. How do you handle those special needs um, where somebody said, oh my gosh, I've got a big funeral on Saturday, the truck was just here yesterday. What, what do they do or how do you take care of that? Well, we, in those particular cases, because we understand the need, it is, it is a common need that we run into. We can either use a courier if we're not going there with our own trucks the next day. A common courier, we'd, we'd put that product out for them. Um, a lot of times the funeral homes know about the funeral a couple days in advance and the families are typically putting in their order a couple days in advance. Not always, but generally. Um, so we typically have enough time to get the right stuff that they need in, in a timely fashion. Oh, so that's great customer service that you provide too. You can help them in their, in their special needs for we what need they to, need. We need to and, and you know that's, that's what the florist is, or that's what the customer is expecting from the florist and, and we need to make them look good as well. How do you price your product? Um, uh, does it go by volume or I, I'm sure that it deals a lot with the amount of time that it takes you to grow a crop. Um. Most, most products that we grow here, we have an established cost that it costs us to do that. The price then depends on the cost of delivering it, the cost of growing it, all of those things, and then, and then the market. The market plays into it as well. Um, you know, in, in July, typically, you can find a cheap rose on the market, and it, and it forces our roses to, to go down as well. Um, but for the most part, it's a pretty set cost to grow each item that we grow here, and, and we price it accordingly. I bet you keep track of the costs per square foot of production, and that way you can use... That, uh, is, that is the, uh, the number one um, profit teller. I noticed up front when we came in, there were some beautiful dish gardens and basket gardens there, and you do those as well? We do that all internally here. We, we actually bring the plants in from Florida and from California, then we put them in baskets along with some of our mixed blooming plants to create a, a finished product for our customers. Time, time is an important thing these days, not only for us, but for our customers as well. If we can provide them a finished product, and it helps them in their jobs, then, then we're doing them a, a good service. 
And I can understand that because sometimes I'm sure labor is an issue and um, if they can save the, the labor costs of having to do that and still have a beautiful product, that does help your customers. It, it allows them to you know, not have to plan as far ahead. They don't have to have the person there right away in the morning to finish that up for the funeral that's at 11 a.m. Um, it's delivered before 9 a.m. and it's ready to go right out the door. I'm thinking of designing a Japanese garden. Uh, can you tell me how to get started? When you start a Japanese garden, you need to figure out where you want it and have it so that you can enjoy it from your house as well as from your garden. You might want to consider a, a simple style to start with. A strolling garden would be good, and with that you'll need a simple path. It's okay to have a primitive or simple path. It doesn't have to be elaborate just a way for you to get through your garden and enjoy it. You can use gravel, stone, any number of materials that you're comfortable with installing. For plant materials, you'll want to keep get to plants that are hardy to our area. And remember that a Japanese garden is a style of garden, not a collection of fancy imported plants. The garden style was developed using native plant materials, and you should do the same. So remember to use plants that are hardy and that make a form that you want in the end. So in here, we use spireas and boxwoods, um, dwarf uh, lilacs, and we use stephanandra on the shady sloped areas to accentuate a, a draping mounding habit. Try and keep the leaf shape small to give a more delicate feel in your garden and keep plants in scale to you, the human being. When it comes to trees, once again, keep the plant, the trees smaller and in scale with you as a human. If you want a pine tree, remember, you're going to have to keep it pruned to accentuate its interesting shape. So that's the key to this, enhancing the shape of the plant's natural shape and planting in groups that will enhance your visit to your space and encourage you to visit your garden over and over again. Ask the Arboretum Experts has been brought to you by the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum in Chanhassen, dedicated to enriching lives through the appreciation and knowledge of plants. I noticed earlier when you talked about the roses and watering the roses, how each plant has its own watering tube. But here we're in a pot flower production house and they don't seem to have individual tubes. How do you water these flowers in here? You are very correct. These are watered a little bit differently. Um, each of these different types of flowers is sitting in a tray. We call them ebb and flow trays. Um, and as you can see, they move fairly easily and they also move down this corridor. These are all pneumatically movable. Um, once we get it into the aisle, this takes it and the computer operates where it, where it goes on its next journey. Um, but each of these trays, instead of being individually water dripped um, per plant, is filled and it fills from the bottom up. Um, the plant absorbs the water it needs and then the water releases into a gutter system which we have here um, and basically it it recirculates that water so it, it it goes into that gutter and it collects in a storage bin underneath and the next time we water this both the fertilizer and the water are reused in the in the same trays how long or how do you know how long to leave the water in the trays does that vary with each crop I'm thinking that each of them takes what it can and, and it releases. Okay. So I think the trays probably fill up for maybe three, four, five minutes and then it releases. Yes. And some of the crops get watered every day and some don't get watered every day. It just depends on what that particular crop's needs are. 
So that's very sustainable then, the fact that you can recycle and reuse the same water. It is very sustainable, yeah. And I'm sure that's quite a labor savings to have these movable benches <laughs> that you can move from greenhouse to greenhouse and then probably right out to your loading trucks too. Once upon a time, each of these plants were handled multiple times um, before they ever left our building. So yes, this is, this is a huge, huge um, cost savings. You bet. Just the labor that you need, yep. one person can probably do what five used to. Right. Wow, that is very interesting that you can do this. And then, did you say that these are pneumatic, that the air helps to the, move yep, the benches too? Pneumatically, to? this, once it gets in the aisle here, it, it pneumatically moves. Okay. Um, so you don't have to be the person pushing a heavy tray. It seems like sustainability is very, very important to your company. What are some other things that you do um, that are in relation to the sustainability? You're right, Mary, it is very important to us. Uh, we need to keep our costs in line and sustaining anything in our process helps with that. Uh, we are a lean manufacturer. Um, about five years ago, we started the process of, of bringing lean manufacturing processes into our workforce and workplace. Um, that has been a key in our, in our cost savings and sustainability. Uh, we also recycle wood chips or we use recycled wood products that tree trimmers and, and people bring in here, we crush them into wood chips and we burn those to create the steam that heats all of these greenhouses on our property. Okay. Without that, we, we really probably couldn't afford to do what we do here. Okay, well when you mentioned that you produce year-round, I wondered how do you heat all of these greenhouses? Which, by the way, how many greenhouses do you have here? We have just short of 16 acres under glass. So a significant amount of space, and obviously if we were trying to heat that with gas or some other product, it would be extremely expensive. Um, so this, this sustainable um, fuel is, has become something that we actually need, to need and rely on. Do you need to keep those wood chips under cover at this time of the year? No, but we do have to move them around. Uh, they can't sit in one place for too long because they can spontaneously combust. So we have to keep them moving, and typically we're not burning a whole lot right now this time of year, but as soon as we get into some cooler nights, we will have to, to start up. You bet. And how do you move those wood chips from the piles into the furnace? Uh, a cat and a, and a truck. I see. Do you have a large conveyor belt, too, that helps move that in, then? We, we don't typically use a conveyor belt. It actually loads into a silo, an old-fashioned silo, and then it auto-feeds the, the, the boiler out of that silo. We see so many beautiful crops uh, growing here. Take us through your crop season here at Len Bush, um, your roses, and all the different pot crops you produce, too. Well, most, most of our cut flower crops are year-round crops, so we, we don't do a whole lot of adjustments for seasons um, because it would just cost too much to, to plant seasonal colors. Um, but in our, in our potted crops, we do a lot of that. Um, example, Christmas, um, we, do, we do grow about 25 to 28,000 poinsettias a year. And obviously that changes the mixture that we have in here right now and it takes up a little more space than, than uh, it does the rest of the year. Um, Valentine's Day we do crop heavy to specific colors in, in, our, in our blooming production. The hotter colors, the pinks and the hot pinks and, and lavenders to try and key in on the, on the emotions for that holiday. Um, when we get to, to spring, Easter, we grow about 23,000 Easter lilies each year. So that does swing, again, what our, what our overall mix is. Um, and then as you can see here, we're getting ready for fall. And we've got mums in all different colors. And uh, that, that continues pretty much from the beginning of July all the way through November, through Thanksgiving. And then you're back at poinsettias again. And then we're back to poinsettias. It's always funny because the first poinsettias go in the greenhouse in July. So you're already thinking about Christmas before summer's even over. Do you take your own uh, poinsettia cuttings or do you also get those in? Nope, we bring those in, in as a cutting as well. Um, I noticed that you use different size pots 
of the same crop, I see that there's some smaller size pots of mums and also some larger. Uh, how do you determine which size that you want to grow and how do you know how to space them out? Um, we've committed to a four and a half inch pot and a six and a half inch pot. We do grow some larger poinsettias and some larger Easter lilies seasonally, um, but for the most part, most, most of our plants are grown in four and a half and six and a half inch increments. Um, the spacing in these actually changes throughout the plant's life. So when these first get put in here, they're little plugs and they're very, very close together. Um, we have a machine now that actually spaces them for us and makes them evenly distributed across the tray and through the length of the tray. But as those plants grow then, we have to re-space them. So we have to bring them back to that machine and do the same thing again. And it actually spaces them a little bit further apart. So as they get bigger and they take up more space, one tray turns into three trays as you, as you spread it. So then can the machine move them from one bench to another? or does there need to be a person that is transferring them from bench to bench? The person has to operate getting it to the, to the aisle row here where the pneumatic takes over. But for the most part, these trays are pretty light and it's very easy for anybody to, to manipulate it a little bit. But for the long stretches, we try and, try and use the, me, the mechanical system. So the plants throughout their lives has the room that they need to grow and develop as nice as they can. Yep. With all of the plants that you have growing here, do you have insect problems at all that you need to monitor and uh, take care of? We do. No matter how hard we try, they still get in right. um, and we have, to, we have to battle with them. But one of the main things that we're doing now is we're using predatory insects to sustainably fight off the bad insects as we call them, um, thrip, uh, aphids, um, spider mite, all those things we actually battle with wasps. So we, we bring in wasps and where the thrip levels are say over what we would consider a uh, acceptable level or a threshold, um, we'll release those predatory wasps in those areas until that level comes back down to a, a sustainable threshold. How do you monitor the insect level? We count. count. Okay. We'll put up sticky cards um, in, a, in specific areas uh, where we notice there may be a little more damage. We'll get a count on how many of those bugs are in that area and then we'll release the predator insects to bring that count back down okay. to a, a manageable level. Again, going back to sustainability too and uh, uh, that's just wonderful. Thank you so much for taking the time today to tell us about Len Bush Roses and to teach us about all the beautiful plants you grow. Well, thank you guys for coming. It is always a pleasure to talk about the stuff that we grow right here in Minnesota. Um, we like to be local and we love it when people use local products. Oh, thank you. Additional support provided by Mark and Margaret Yakel Julien in honor of Shalom Hill Farm a nonprofit rural education retreat center in a beautiful prairie setting near Wyndham in southwestern Minnesota. ShalomHillFarm.org.